one channel sound, eight colors, 48K of RAM, and tape-based storage. No wonder Tim Stamper, in a 1988 interview for Crash, called the ZX Spectrum a piece of garbage. Despite that, Ultimate Play the Game and many other of yesteryear's coders cut their teeth on its Z80 processor. So say what you like about this rubber-keyed curiosity, but it won the hearts and minds of the average punter. But get this, the ZX Spectrum helped put Ultimate Play the Game on the map. Sadly for Saberman, Pentagram was his fourth and final adventure on the ZX Spectrum. Yes, Maya Mare was touted as Saberman's final adventure, but alas, and sadly, it never saw the light of day. Pentagram's strengths are that it's more of the same stuff, but you can't help feeling this is a rushed version of Alien 8 or Night Law. No doubt isometric fanboys were in their element with this, but for the rest of us, we were looking for something a little bit different, a little bit more creative. Ah, Bubbler. Now the game concept remains intriguing and boasts several delightful features. Uh, however, the movement controls could have been better, could have benefited from simplification. A bit more thought, streamlining them would have allowed players to focus more on the puzzles. And I think with some adaptation, the game could have offered uh, both a challenge and a bit more enjoyment. It doesn't look great either, but if you could get used to the controls back in the day, this held a really good challenge. It was a really good game. And I can imagine this one has its fan base. Good old Cyber Run. For me, this is a classic shoot 'em up with brilliant graphics, smooth play, and all the violence you could wish for from a measly 48K ZX Spectrum. The playing area felt immense back in the day. And I don't disagree with your Sinclair's review. They said it's a classic pick up the pieces and shoot them up with brilliant graphics. And even today, if you've not experienced Cyber Run, I wholeheartedly recommend it. They tried something different and for that I commend them. I'd love to see the collected works on the Nintendo Switch. This one, Underworld, was both fun and frustrating for me. Don't get me wrong, for the time, it's technically excellent and everything you'd expect from Ultimate. The frustration comes from 600 flip screens. The game is bigger than my head. Saying that, riding volcanic bubbles and being carried by gigantic birds added to the thrill. The other good thing is that Saberman isn't harmed by the enemies. He's just knocked about a bit, battered and bruised. Very frustrating if you're knocked from top to bottom. I've never found my sword, and I've never managed to escape. Sinclair user gave Nightshade 100%. I carumba. But Nightshade uh, continues the legacy of Night Law and Alien 8, enhancing their brilliant 3D graphics. It's set in a medieval village. The game introduces color screens and maintains an arcade-like pace. It'll keep you guessing for a long time and it will keep you playing even longer. By this point though, the critics of the day were already complaining about the similar isometric format for their games. If I've said it once, I'll say it again. Never listen to the critics. Although Martianoids is another isometric game, it's an isometric game at a different tilt with smooth directional scroll. And get this, Sinclair user awarded this 100%. Jeez, oh, the Stamper Brothers must have dug deep into their pockets for this one. It's good, but it won't drive anyone into a wild frenzy of excitement. But I also wouldn't have gone down the route that Crash Magazine went down, where they completely panned this game. They said it was boring and that Ultimate was in demise. So two specy mags, extreme opposites, Now Cookie, this is a game that threatened to come out on the BBC and Commodore 64, but ended up games that weren't. Now I'm not just playing through a list of games until we get to the good ones. 
These are all really good still today to play, in my humble opinion. I kid you not, one minute I'm playing God of War Ragnarok on the PS5, the next minute I'm playing Cookie. I can't tell you why, I just roll with the punches, we are where we are. Oh by the way, God of War Ragnarok, that's a great game. On that bombshell, let's move on to Alien 8. In Alien 8, we have an unlikely hero in a maintenance bot. You've got until the time limit to avoid a disaster. You've got puzzles, tricky jumps, and other deadly robots. You're 600 light years from your destination and 130 screens away from completion. And each new game starts on a different screen, which for me really helped ramp up the replay value. Warning though, don't even bother attempting to play this without a map. Unless, like me, you love your punishment. My father had a Trans Am. I remember he used to drop me to school in it. So this one brings back memories, double memories, and like the game, both were great times. But think of it this way, this was 1983, and it was an open world game where you drove at breakneck speeds across America. I think as a six or seven year old kid, I found it really compulsive, but it wasn't until I picked it up a couple of years ago that I truly mastered the art of evasion, along with fuel management to progress. Up there with Jetpack, I don't altogether remember the first time I played Gunfright, but what I do remember is being completely immersed in it. It felt like I was playing an arcade game. You'd get your orders, you'd go out there, you'd hunt down the baddies, and then there was a shootout. If you were quick on the draw, then you'd get your bonus. Graphically, at the time, I couldn't fault it. It felt highly detailed, and the bells and whistles, unlike previous Ultimate Play the Game games, was brilliant. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. Oh, that's a different game. Sorry. Do 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 do. All I can tell you about pss, I think that's how you say it, is that it's really addictive and the graphics are brilliant. Don't forget this is 1983. I'm amazed that Ultimate or other developers even got stuff moving on the screen. Yes, that's it. This is Color Clash at its finest. But you know what? Graphics don't make a game. This has got bags of playability and it still plays a blinder today. If you don't feel the same way as me, then I'm sorry you've taken a wrong turn. You shouldn't be here. These games make the hairs on my back stand up. Ah, Luna Jetman. Another early and phenomenal game. Apart from the keyboard setup, I could never get on with it. I think eventually I managed to get a joystick and never look back. But again, this is one I was only really ever good at later on in life. And I was sucked in too by all the hysteria in the mag about there being a trailer part. I remember this kid at school, he came in and told everybody he'd found it. What an absolute liar. We were asking him questions relentlessly about it. Where'd you go? Where did you find it? This thing went on for months. Great game. Good old night law. I bet some of you were thinking this should be number one. And it probably should, but that's just a testament to how great the games were from Ultimate. Quality and innovation, the likes will probably never see again. In fact, it was so influential that the Drummond brothers went off and programmed Head Over Heels. Back in the day, this was one of the best games I'd ever played. I'd never experienced anything like it. I just couldn't get enough. And I'm sad to say, I never completed it. Oh my goodness, Sabre Wolf. I absolutely love this game. Wandering around the maze, everything was attacking you, in search for a broken amulet. Again, I don't think I'd played anything like it before. And this so easily could have been my number one as opposed to number three. It's truly terrific to play. And my kids played it as well and think it's brilliant, especially when the wolf gives chase. And the good thing about this game as well, the thing that most people probably won't consider, is that if you die, you start again. But this time, the amulets are in a different place. It was something Ultimate did really well and always added to the longevity.
Number two, jetpack. You see the cat's out the bag now. Everybody knows what number one is. But honestly, this is one of the best games, best arcade games I've ever played. And it came from Ultimate. I also purchased this on Rare Replay on Xbox. And it played just as good, if not better, than what I remember. So that there, in its very essence, is testament to game design. Good, solid game design. And it shows, it goes to prove as well, that the Stamper Brothers were ahead, massively ahead, of the game. And no doubt went on to help shape the industry. On that note, just before we get to number one, I just want to talk about how important Rare, i.e. Ultimate Play the Game, were to the Nintendo NES. As the ZX Spectrum came towards the end of its life, the Stamper Brothers noticed the NES in Japan, and it's here where they took the console and reversed engineered it. Nintendo was so impressed that they gave them a contract to make games for their system. Rare, as they were known at the time, went on to create a staggering amount of games for the NES console, but also Nintendo's other consoles as well, including the handheld, the Game Boy. It proved a massive success for both companies, and Rare went on to thrive on the Super Nintendo as well, and later the N64. By this point, Nintendo had purchased massive shares within Rare. Rare went on to program Blast Corps, the Banjo-Kazooie series, GoldenEye, Perfect Dark, and one of my personal favorites, Conker's Bad Fur Day. So it poses the question, without Rare, i.e. Ultimate Play the Game, would Nintendo even be a force today? Would they even exist? What would have happened if Sega would have signed Rare? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Right then, drum roll please. Here is number one. Number one, the legendary Attic Attack. Probably the most famous game ever. Whenever I'm down in the pub or at a retro event, you name it, this game always comes up. Some people don't get this game. Some people don't understand the intricacies or the excitement or what made it a phenomena. And I'm dumbfounded by that because Attic Attack has got everything, every type of core gameplay you could ever wish for. It's an explore em up a shoot em up a pick em up and best of all, a map em up Well, that's it. Until next time, ta a bit. And don't forget to subscribe. Bye!